I'm Steve Cheney, the CEO of the American Security Project, and you're probably wondering what Bluegrass has to do with national security. <laughs> and, and so am I. <laughs> but we're really thrilled to have Della May here and, and talk about your trip and what you've been up to. And it's a little different tack for the American Security Project, but we take on a number of subjects, not the least of which are energy security, nuclear security, American competitiveness, uh, terrorism, asymmetric operations, and public diplomacy. And I have a fellow that handles the public diplomacy side of the house, and that is Matthew Wallen. So Matthew is the one who found out about you all, and we're really excited to have you here today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew to talk about public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. And gentlemen, Matthew, again, ladies, thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And of course, I'd like to thank our guest, Della May, for being here as well. Um, they do a lot of traveling, and DC's just another one of their stops. So <laughs> glad we could bring them in today. Um, I do do the cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy research here at ASP. Um, we look at this as a national security issue, primarily because of what happened during September 11th. And people wonder, well, why did they hate us? And we really thought that this is something that we need to look at from more than just that perspective. Cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy for us is about building long-term relationships. It's about finding alternative ways to communicate with people, to solve our problems in a collaborative manner, and find solutions that work best, not only for us, but for our partners, and sometimes for people that we don't always agree with overseas as well. Um, cultural diplomacy specifically is about humanizing U.S. culture and the people that live here. Um, it's a lot different than saying drones over Pakistan, and people might think, well, that's the only thing that I understand about the U.S. They fly drones over my country. No, it's not really about that. There's a lot more to the United States, and I think it's important for us to get out there and discuss these sorts of issues with people from a basic person-to-person, in-person, last three feet perspective. Cultural diplomacy is also about showcasing the diversity, and I think that's one of the biggest strengths that this country has. We're not just a homogenous group. We have a lot of differing opinions, a lot of different people, a lot of cultural, cultural things that come from all over the world, and it's important to show that that's what we're really about. Um, it's about setting the stage for broader discussions. You know, cultural diplomacy itself isn't going to solve anything on its own. But when you pair it with different types of diplomacy and look at other ways of, of communicating and addressing your issues, it can be used as a catalyst to sort of boost that conversation and move it forward, where it's otherwise not going to do that. And there's a long history of cultural diplomacy in the US. Uh, the State Department, back in the day, promoted things like the Family of Man, or I should say, United States Information Agency, um, which was a photography exhibit that we sent around the world to, to basically showcase humanity to itself. Um, and music itself, obviously, is a, is a key issue in cultural diplomacy, and there's a big history of this as well. Uh, the State Department used to have the, uh, the State Department and USIA would promote the uh, Jazz Ambassador Program. We'd send people like Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, Benny Goodman, and Duke Ellington overseas to show, well, we're not just about orchestras and ballet. We have this whole side of American culture that's really popular in some parts of the world and really gives people um, a, a good idea of what we are as a country. Um, and it can be used to break down barriers. When Benny Goodman went overseas to the Soviet Union in 1962, it's something that took years to accomplish. The Soviet Union had declared jazz to be something that was vulgar and decadent. And, decadent. and this was something that we wanted to showcase isn't. It's really about democratic values. It's about showcasing this is what we do with our culture. So basically from that perspective, I'd like to turn it over to Delamay and then let them tell you about what they did. Um, We've got a, a, a number of ladies on the panel. We have Sue Woodsmith, who does vocals and rhythm guitar. Kimber Ludiker, who does film. Uh, Jenny Lynn Gardner, who does mandolin. Courtney Hartman plays guitar. And Shelby Means plays bass. Um, they participated in the American Music Abroad Tour, which is basically a, a graduation, essentially, of the uh, Jazz Ambassadors program. It's an evolution. Um, Delamay was formed in Boston. Their first album was I Built This Heart, released in 2011. Their second album, I believe, is due to be released this month, called This World Off Can Be. Um, their tour with American Music Abroad was of Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. So they will be talking about that. Um, it was administered by American Voices, which is sponsored by the Department of State and the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau. Um, they, were, they do programs like public concerts, interactive performances with local traditional musicians, lecture demonstrations, workshops, jam sessions, and media interviews and performance. Um, American Music Abroad, American Voices, uh, promotes all sorts of American music that's traditional, like blues, bluegrass, Cajun country, folk, Latin, Native American music, gospel, 
hip hop, urban, um, <coughs> any rock, jazz, punk, and R&B. So there's a lot of Americana. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over to our guests. So, um, sorry, we first found out about American Music Abroad through some friends of ours who had done it, and they had traveled throughout the Middle East a little bit, and so I had brought the idea to the band to say this, this seems like something that would be a really amazing experience, and so we applied and were chosen, and the countries that they chose us to go to weren't necessarily our choice, and they had a say in what bands came to their embassies. So that area of, of the world really wanted us to come there. So we ended up doing six countries, which is more than any of the other bands did in one tour. And so we, I mean, we were here in DC in October. We had no idea what to expect. We were about to leave for Islamabad, which was our first destination. And we, like, our whole perspective on those places of the world has totally changed and our eyes have been opened in that way. So. The program sends 12 bands over, and mostly to third world countries and places where the relationships between the U.S. and their countries are strained or new. Um, one country in particular we were at was in Turkmenistan, and we performed for the first ever collaboration between the American and Turkmen government um, since the Soviet Union fell. So that was a very honoring thing for us to be a part of. There was a picture earlier where you saw President Obama and also the president of Turkmenistan together, and that was the first time that a president other than the Turkmen president had ever been hung up next to their president, so that was a pretty big deal. Um, but that's kind of the, how we found out about the program, was just, just through friends, and there's about 400 bands that apply, and then they choose 12 to go over. You can see that we put together uh, this whole slideshow of all the countries that we go to, and. There are a lot of pictures of us with uh, doing workshops with children, and I think that was some of our favorite things that we did while we were abroad. Um, like Matthew mentioned earlier, we, we do workshops, we do collaborations, we do a lot of press, a lot of news conferences. Um, we go meet everyone at the embassies, and we eventually do one or two concerts uh, for local people in the country. Um, we did, I think we did one in each large city that we visited um, in each country. Um, but you'll see the favorite things that we did were with the children. And I think that's a lot of where we made our most impact is being able to do these uh, hands-on workshops with kids. We actually wish that we had more time with the kids because a lot of them had never touched an instrument before. It's just an instrument in general. And then to touch one of our instruments, which were so different than theirs, and have that sort of exchange between them. A lot of the kids would teach us how to play one of their instruments, and we would teach them how to play one of our instruments. And um, so I think uh, that, for me, was the most impactful, just seeing these young kids really having their eyes open to meeting an American person, hearing what bluegrass music was, which was a very funny thing to try and explain to them. Uh, to anybody, really? To anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, when we went to Pakistan, we played for two women's colleges. And a lot of those women had never, ever seen uh, live music before. And they had never seen women playing live music. So when we first got there, we had traveled from DC to Kuwait to Islamabad, and we, we had no sleep, we had four hours of sleep maybe, and um, we got to the school, and we were backstage sort of having some tea and getting ready, and we hear this screaming, this and like kind of rumbling, what is going on out there? And all of the girls were so excited that we were there. They were literally shaking the doors of the auditoriums. <laughs> and the security guards had to open the doors because they were afraid the girls were going to break the doors. <laughs> so to have that kind of welcome, the minute we stepped off the plane into Pakistan, just completely erased any preconceived notion that we possibly could have had about who these people were, what they were going to think of us. Um, it really put us at ease, and I think that set the tone for the whole tour. We were greeted with such enthusiasm 
and such just just love. You know, there were some tricky, yeah, hospitality. There were some tricky questions and tricky sort of, I guess, feelings of, you know, our, our countries and how they feel about one another. But we really stuck to just music and not politics. And I think that opened up a lot of doors. Besides having not heard of bluegrass before, most of the children that we worked with, um, a lot of them were in orphanages and boarding schools, which are basically schools that are orphanages. But they hadn't really had any sort of interaction with Americans before. And one thing that was really special was that um, we got to see a few um, of comments and stuff from people in Pakistan to other audiences. And to see what they said after watching our performance, a lot of them, we had comments like we thought all Americans were racist or, you know, things like that where hopefully, besides our eyes being opened to their hospitality and generosity, they had a bit of a different view of Americans after seeing us. Yeah, I think one of the most important things about us going over there is that normal citizens got to meet normal citizens instead of government people going over there and dealing with government people and uh, then dealing with the citizens like we all, you know, it was, it was just normal people interacting with normal people and that was the whole premise of the program in the first place is that if we get to know each other, uh, we can build bridges and, and realize that, you know, we do have some differences but we're all basically the same. We have the same fears and the same heartbreaks and you know, we have such deep friendships with people from every country that we've been to that we keep in touch with, and hopefully we'll get to go back, um, and we'd like to go back and, and visit all those guys. And yeah, it was really a really good experience. Uh, are there any questions from anybody in the audience about what we did or countries we went to? Or? Yeah, which countries did you go to? Yeah, we sometimes try and say it as fast as we can going down the line. <laughs> Maybe today we'll just say them. Okay. Who's got it? Pakistan. Oh, I guess we're going to try it. Turkmenistan. Kyrgyzstan. Tajikistan. And Uzbekistan. Oh, Uzbekistan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those were all the countries we went to. We had, um, like someone said before, we had the longest trip. It was six weeks long with six countries. About a week in each country, I think we spent about nine days in Pakistan. We went to Islamabad and Lahore. And um, actually, another uh, another project that we're working with in Pakistan, uh, and then maybe someone can tell you about uh, a really amazing experience we had in Tajikistan. Um, we are currently partnering with this program called Let Us Be Kids in Pakistan. And uh, it was one of the first experiences we had. Was that yeah, that was in Islamabad, and um, we went and we played for these kids in a, in a park, and they were all street children, um, a lot of them Afghan refugees, um, a lot of them Pakistani children, uh, between the ages of, I'd say, maybe 5 to 12, um, and we played music for them. There's there's pictures up there, which are, they're amazing pictures, but... Um, we played music for them, and one of the things I really loved was as we were playing, all of the little boys kind of like slowly pitter-pattered away, and all the little girls actually stayed and hung out with us and um, watched as we played and let them touch our instruments. And the, the head of Let Us Be Kids later told us that that was really special because those little girls never talk to anybody or never let anybody else near them. It's normally the boys who stay and hang out and the girls kind of go to the back of back of the room and don't have much engagement with uh, the guests that day. But we really got some hands-on work with these beautiful little girls. And um, I'm hoping that we gave them a little bit of confidence and a little bit of, you know, their eyes open to you know, these five women are from America, able to stand up and play music for a living. And, you know, I think we help give them a little bit of self-worth. Um, but since then, we have we were so moved by Let Us Be Kids that we partnered with them, and we're going to keep kind of working with them. And uh, we're, we brought over 
they make this amazing art. They're called bee greets. Oh yeah, there's some of them right there. Um, they're called these are called bee greets, and they're little greeting cards that they all do. The, the point of Let Us Be Kids is to have a safe space for these children to just be a kid instead of be working and picking up trash on the street all day. And so they draw, and they go to the zoo, and they jump on trampolines, and they have uh, guests come and play music or do fun things with them. So we brought um, all of these bee greets over to the US, and we've been selling them to promote their cause. And we also donated um, all of the proceeds from our return concert um, to them, which turned out to be more than half of what they get each year from the government to operate as a program. Almost three thousand dollars, and the grant that they get is from our government. Um, they get a certain amount. We work with the embassy in Islamabad to do that. Um, I wanted to ask a question because you, you were talking about the way that that girls were behaving as, as opposed to the boys, and it was the gender dynamic something that you guys, the girls, paid a lot of attention to when you were over there. Did you find there was generally a lot of different interaction or different responses you could get from male versus female audiences? The only times that we had either an all-female or all-male audience was just at the women's colleges. It was all women, for the most part. Other than that, it was all nice. But we didn't notice that there was a lot of a lot of segregation. Um, like the boys would all eat together, and the girls would all eat together. And when this is blue, especially in Pakistan. In Pakistan, mm -hmm. yeah. In the other countries after Pakistan, that the gender segregation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the way that say. Um, when you were speaking to men versus women in some of the countries, was there a different sort of way that they would respond to you? Um, do you know, especially because there's such a gender dynamic in, in some of those countries. Um, they felt really comfortable with us. We met such, I mean, they were, it just reminded me of, like, all, all the girls that we talked to reminded me kind of of American teenagers or our own friends are really excited and talking about things, but, uh, but definitely with different cultural filters. And I think it, it was also a class dynamic. Um, the kids that we were working with in Let Us Be Kids, they were the poorest of the poor. And I think the gender dynamic there, the girls were obviously much more painfully shy than the boys, who were very shy around us, because I don't really think they knew how to respond to American women. Um, but that, to me, was the most obvious um, gender dynamic, like the other girls were saying, when we went to these women's colleges, I mean, they almost tore the doors off this, the, the auditorium, for, you know, they they were not shy at all. You know, they they came up to the stage and wanted to take pictures, and, you know, they have, since then, I think we all have about 500 more Pakistani friends on Facebook, and, you know, they just love writing to you, they love posting pictures, and they want their picture with you, and, you know, it really did, it, it felt, like they just wanted more and more and more and, and they weren't at all like who, who do you think you are you know, coming here and um, so those women were you know they did have the opportunity to get an education and um, you know to be going to a school like that but the the little kids that we worked with obviously were in a very different place class wise um, so I think that's where I saw the most gender dynamic that, that's it's very interesting what you mentioned about continuing these relationships afterwards, whether they're young kids or maybe even young adults that you're dealing with. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're still interacting with them now that you've returned to the United States? Definitely made a very strong impact on all of us. Um, I mean, Celia mentioned the B greets, and we all have uh, new Facebook friends that we some of them you know stay in touch with, and they can stay in touch with us. But um, we, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how impacted I would be coming back to the States after having been to all of the countries and seen, you know, met all the people and um, done the work that we did. It's, it's really important to us to share what we learned about um, all of the countries and the people over there. And we're a lot more, I just, I feel like we're a lot more similar than we, than the media allows us to. <laughs> I found myself getting really annoyed when I would when I got back. We were there for 42 days, and I would just, you know, you hear the the term first world problems, 
and I would just watch people get upset about these little things that were so materialistic or just ridiculous, and I just wanted to like, ah, come on, I have no clue. Um, so it was really good. I think it was really great for us to be somewhat disconnected from the world that we grew up in and kind of immerse ourselves in those cultures, and we learned a lot of great values. You know, people are really family-oriented and really loving and giving, and uh, I don't know, it was a really good atmosphere to be in. Can we talk about the musical exchange? Yeah. Oh, I just want to mention as well, there's um, such an atmosphere of fear when countries like Pakistan are mentioned, and most of that is based in ignorance, and so having been there and like had these exchanges with these people to come back and like tell our audiences, be like, these people are beautiful and amazing and so talented, that's been like one of the biggest blessings of having had that experience. And there's a girl, there's one girl that we met and got to play with a lot. Her name is Natasha Ejaz, and she lives in Islamabad. And she's, I went to Berkeley College of Music, and she's applying now, so I've been able to help her and be in contact. So that's been really cool. Um, but music, the music collaborations was a really, really important part of it. So every city that we went to, we had <coughs> local musicians that we got to play with, and they played on the concert with us. I was just gonna say, um, we collaborated with so many of these different artists um, in every country, as Courtney just said, and we, some of the times they were playing instruments that we had never seen before, and I don't think that many of them had ever seen our instruments. They had different variations on folk instruments, but we would sit down and within 15 minutes, we'd have the start of exchanging um, songs together, and. Um, it was, it was really interesting to see how quickly we can learn each other's music and um, speak to each other through the music and not be able to speak each other's language. And um, we did travel with a translator and um, it would be like we wouldn't need the translator when we were playing music together because so quickly we would be able to, to pick up on what each other was doing and even have inside jokes and be laughing together. Music is I've said this countless amount of times since we got back, but music is a universal language. And I felt like it was very, very effective in meeting people and making friendships um, through the music. Any other questions? That's, uh, I, I just got you know, a question. Did you, have, did you have security concerns? I mean, when you think about Pakistan and, and some of the areas there are pretty hostile, one, security, and secondly, the attitude that they have towards women, and in particular, American women. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that absolutely. You know, we were debriefed when we went to uh, Islamabad and Lahore with the security people, and they were, you know, we talk about we talk about our time in Pakistan just with with such wonder and amazement, and at the same time, there was that undercurrent of they were very very careful with us. You know, we went everywhere in an armored vehicle. And in Lahore, we were escorted by um, armed police, armed local police. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, it, it did feel more restricted in, in Pakistan, especially. Nowhere else was really the security as much of a concern. Um, but, but I mean, Pakistan, we really we we played in the rules. You know, we didn't go anywhere by ourselves, and we stayed with our escorts, but at the same time, I never felt like I was in any imminent danger. People were more like, oh my gosh, I want to meet you. You know, it was, it was like, you know, this really, oh, who are you? Like, I want to, you play music? When can I come to your show? So I think that has been a really nice thing to help dispel when we're here in the United States. You know, most people are like, oh my God, did you have to wear a burqa? Did you have to go in the cover of darkness to all of your concerts? It's no, we didn't. You know, we, we went out and we walked around and we you know, met local people on the streets and we did a lot of normal things within a certain security constraint, but I never felt um, unsafe at any time. There was one instance where we're doing a public concert in, was that in Lahore? 
<clears throat> and there was some concern about our all of our big concerts were private invitation. Uh, they didn't want it getting into the media um, in case there was kind of potential targeting or anything. But well, there was one instance where our our concert was leaked kind of to the newspaper or something. <coughs> they were private only in Pakistan and other countries. Yeah. They were totally public and free. We were on billboards and. Jumbotrons. <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> in, Turkmenistan, the in Turkmenistan, we were like on jumbotrons in the city, and we walk into the airport, awesome. and we were like on the news playing. And like, we already stick out like a sore thumb everywhere we went. It's just kind of like my fiddles, you know. Was in, you know was in, in Turkmenistan, I think one of my favorite moments of oh my god, this could cause a public diplomacy problem was. Uh, Courtney and I had bought these enormous um, Turkmen hats, which are basically, I mean, there's a picture on there, but they're about this big, and they're cheap, I think. And it's just, like they're, whole they're beautiful, fluffy hats. And they're supposed to be, men are supposed to wear them. And they're very, you know, they're more nationalist in Turkmenistan. Their women really look and dress a certain way, and it's, you know, they're very proud of their country. and. Um, and so Courtney and I ran on stage wearing these men's Turkmen hats, and you could hear the audience just be like, <gasps> and then they all looked at the the who was it the secretary of I don't know. They looked at their main person and okay, we can clap. <laughs> so you know, we obviously would try to mix things up and make things funny and. A little bit more loose and just show them who American women are and we just wanted to be ourselves we tried to be you know who we are at all times now, Steve, Steve was mentioning security I think that's a really interesting thing is we're looking at it from you know threats from sort of the general population or extremists that might be in that population I recall when I was speaking to Paul who managed you while you were overseas that there was an incident in Uzbekistan with some cell phones yeah, can we talk about that? <laughs> I think it's important to talk about that. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> Go Cooper. <laughs> Paul and I, we had gotten to, to Pakistan, and we decided we would have a beer. To to Uzbekistan. 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 We just arrived <coughs> in Uzbekistan from Pakistan. So we, it was our first night, actually, our first night in Uzbekistan, and we went to the... We're all a lot older than we look, actually. So. <laughs> that was um, anyway, so we, we walked down to the bar, and we had an issue, actually, with a gentleman that was from Russia that um, he saw Paul and basically just started making fun of him because he was Jewish, and then pinpointed that we were Americans and just started like getting in nitty gritty about how awful we are. And I was kind of like, I play the fiddle, you know, we can't help where we're born, and you were born there, and I was born here, do you want me to go get my fiddle? Like, I'll play you a tune, let's, I'll play you a fiddle. And, and him and, you know, Paul were having these very, like, just kind of like discussions about differences, and it was like going pretty well, you know. And then he just wanted to keep like buying vodka, I'm sure you've heard about the vodka scene over there. Um, and then we finally, you know, I like invited to our concert and I say, you know, I'll leave tickets for you at the front desk, you can pick up, we'd love for you to come. And it ended up being like a friendly thing after a while. Like he was just kind of trying to get a rise out of us and I was just like, fiddle, I'll play your tune. And we go back to the room and my cell phone was missing. Um, my embassy issued cell, cell phone, they provided us phones uh, to get in contact with each other while we were there. And I knew exactly where I plugged it in, and it was not there. And so I was kind of freaking out, like, I'm going to have to tell the embassy. And anyway, so two days later, they found me and said that they had found my cell phone in a restaurant on the second which I hadn't been to. Um, and it was kind of like in a plastic bag and I turned it on and it had full battery. So if I left it, it was on and it would have died. And so it was kind of just a weird thing, but I got it back and then Paul's phone 
went missing as well, and then ended up being returned. But I don't know. The the crazy thing is like we don't have any. We're not privy to any kind of information. So there was they could go through any of our stuff. I, I think for us it was, you know, in, in Uzbekistan and in Turkmenistan, they had told us upon arriving that we would most likely, you know, our emails would be monitored and that we would most likely be followed and or um, that uh, really they encouraged us not to say anything that we would regret saying um, until we left the country. Um, so we really respected those rules and we just understood that you know, some things work differently and that our mission there was to play music and not to get caught up with anything politically um, because we felt that you know our mission is is playing music we are musicians we're not international spies you know we, we were there for that reason and so we we did we played within the rules and strange things did happen but that, that seems sort of normal in a way yeah, I think that you know we're we're so used to being Americans and being a you know we have the freedom of speech and we can do kind of whatever we want to within limitation, and different countries operate totally differently and there's just you know there's just certain differences that I don't really even understand it actually. <laughs> I don't think we, any of us really understand what was going on. We're just there with our instruments. And well, I think that's something that's really sort of key to point out and explaining about what America is you know, overseas. And in some places, they have no concept of what exactly freedom of speech means or what freedom means in general. Um, that was particularly important during the Cold War in the area of the Soviet Union, where we had to deal with that sort of stuff. And actually getting musicians into the Soviet Union was a major international accomplishment because we get to show them, look, what you've been hearing us about this isn't necessarily true. This is what we do. This is freedom. I mean, jazz shows what the soloist can do, and there was an, a columnist in the New York Times who was talking about this. Shows what the soloist can do within the rules, basically. They have the freedom to express themselves whichever way they wish within a set of rules, and I think that's really sort of a key, a, a key thing to demonstrate overseas. And freedom doesn't necessarily mean you can do anything at all that you want, but you know there, there are some limits, and you have to perform within those limits. Um, were there any other questions for for Delamay shows us what they did? Yeah. Yeah, I just had one quick question. I wanted to know, was there any sort of perception of like what American music was when you guys go over there? Because obviously it's traditional country. Um, so that's sort of how we would explain bluegrass to them. And they didn't understand, like, bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> but they also, in Uzbekistan, I love this, they started calling it blue ooze grass. Like, <laughs> blue Uzbekistan <laughs> grass. <laughs> Which was strange, but hey, I was glad that they made that little connection there. That was our, um, that was such an amazing musical kind yeah. Uzbekistan. They're um, such incredible musicians, and and we we had you know when Jenny was talking about not being able to speak the same language and learning from each other, we we hung out with uh, a lot of the musicians there, and it was such a powerful connection for us that our our music's meshed really well. And that was a cool experience. Mm -hmm. Actually, in Uzbekistan, we met. I think she's the only banjo player in Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. This or woman in 
again in Central Asia, even maybe. <laughs> Jana Kim, I think. Jana Kim. Yeah. And she found out that we were playing in Uzbekistan. She came to, to see us and she brought her banjo and we had a little jam session. She's learned banjo on YouTube, basically. She looked up. She's like 15. <laughs> it was so amazing. And, was amazing. and a group in America actually, Neckville Banjo sent her a banjo um, to Uzbekistan, and that was the one that she was playing. Uh, so there had already been some sort of American exchange there, and uh, she came to our dressing room, and her father had this video camera. It was just <laughs> video cameraing every second of her getting to play bluegrass for really the first time in her life. With people. With other yeah. people. So there's a great video on YouTube that you guys should look up. Just look up like Della May, Uzbekistan. Yeah. Actually there are there are many really amazing some of the collaborations that we did in Pakistan, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, if they're all up on YouTube, uh, there are some really special moments. Yeah, where we especially in Kyrgyzstan, we actually kind of wove two of our songs together where we started out singing a song and then this other group of five women who was chosen to play with us out of an or orchestra, it's a traditional uh, instrument orchestra, five women were chosen to play with us. Uh, we started this song and then they kind of went into a, one of their traditional songs then we went out of it ending with our song. So um, I think that, that was a very special collaboration for me especially. A lot of female musicians in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. And Kazakhstan. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Can we hear you play? Yeah. 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 Well, you were I was just wondering uh, who decided who you're going to meet with? I noticed you said something that mm -hmm. a lot of concerts were public and we kind of talked about some of the people you met with, but was it kind of the U.S. Embassy in those countries? Was it the government of those countries? Kind of both? Do you have a, kind of any input in that? It was. Okay. It was um, some organized by American Voices, which is the organization here that works with the State Department. And then also each embassy kind of took care of us. So they, each embassy here ordered consulate in each city would kind of take us in, and they had the connections to kind of put us where they wanted. So that was the goal of it. Yeah. Do we call it? How about we make you? Is there a recording of all these songs? We did one like actual recording in Pakistan, which was for radio, um, and it was with a group there. But we didn't record a lot of the other music other than videos. That would have been a really cool thing yeah. to do, like go into the studio with a bunch of those musicians, and hopefully if we go back, we'll have that opportunity. Yeah. There has been, uh, I will mention, there's been a great collaboration with American instrument instrumentalists and uh, instrumentalists instrumentalist from Uzbekistan um, with uh, Bela Fleck, who's a like the famous banjo player in the world, and a bunch of those guys. And I guess it took Bela, who is um, pretty much the best banjo player in the entire world. It took him like three hours on this this one song. It's really difficult music, and just the the little nuances and everything. Um, we have a deep respect for. And before we will definitely going to play you, actually, I think two things that we learned while abroad. One of them that we uh, sing pretty consistently at our concerts here that we learned in Pakistan. And that for us has been a really special way of um, telling people wherever we play. Um, we did this, you know, we went on this trip, we went to these countries that most Americans know very little about, that we knew very little about before we went there. We came back, we're in one piece, and it was amazing, and listened to this music, and um, that has been a really great way for us to reach out to our audiences and sort of make a little bit of an educational component to our performances. Um,